World War II was brought to a terrifying end on August 9, 1945, when the United States dropped a bomb on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Although the United States was founded pr to promote peace, we had already been involved in several world wars and were headed into the um, Cold War with the Soviet Union during this period of time, which was a nuclear arms standoff. The most interesting art was not in Europe, as we had seen prior, but in New York City. The Museum of Modern Art had opened in 1935, and it was the first Western museum for modern art. This museum assembled and collected uh, exhi exhibitions on Cubism, uh, post-Impressionism, and a lot of progressive European artists spent their years in exile in New York. So when they had to leave uh, the regions of the areas in Europe that were being heavily affected by the war, they came to New York City to work. Peggy Guggenheim also opened a gallery, which she had called Art of the Century, and later opened the Guggenheim Museum, also in Manhattan. Uh, the Art of the Century showed a lot of avant-garde European artists, as well as promising young Americans. The first major post-war movement that we saw in the United States, as well as in Europe, rather that included European artists, we called the New York School, which was not a school, but a label that lumped together this group of painters, which we also call abstract expressionists. Primary among them was an artist named Jackson Pollock, whose work we'll look at shortly, but abstract impressionism itself was accumulation of expressive tendencies. So all those post-impressionist artists that we saw, the Favs, um, the uh, Van Gogh, Voulard, people that were focusing on automatic surrealism such as Dali. Um, these, all these artists were lumped together under abstract expressionism and the focus was on spontaneous and personal expression, mostly abstract or even non-representational like Kandinsky was. This is one of Jackson Pollock's very early pieces, uh, aptly titled Number One. This is a drip painting. You'll watch a video shortly about Pollock and it shows does show him working a little bit. But we often call this gesture painting because it's recording the gesture uh, or the movements of the artist. Pollock was influenced by surrealism uh, and really focused on the creative power of the unconsciousness. Most of the painters in the New York School developed very individualized and highly recognizable and differentiated styles. But what they really had in, in common was working on a really large format. Uh, and as you'll see in the video, Pollock was working on these huge rolls of canvases. This painting itself has no focal point. The idea is that you're being engulfed by this large screen of an image, almost like a movie would engulf you. There's no composition, and the idea is a field of energy, a spray of energy, a spray of a crashing wave. He had abandoned the easel and focused on controlling the flow of paint on the canvas. This action painting or gesture painting capturing the trace and even the dance and emotional state of the artist. Pollock himself, as a character, was a deeply troubled man. There's another fantastic uh, movie about him. Uh, I, I had mentioned to you the movie about Frida Kahlo called Frida. There's a movie called Pollock about Jackson Pollock, also really wonderful, portrays his life and times. He was not a natural artist. He was not somebody that was born really competent in drawing. He tried very, very, very hard to be a more traditional artist and couldn't draw well at all, as you'll see in the video. So please watch these two videos um, that are just a continuation of each other, part one and part two, um, in your links below. There's a wonderful modern artist named Heather Hansen, who is also working in action paintings, a similar way to what Jackson Pollock did. Please watch this video on Vimeo on Heather Hansen's work. William de Kooning was also part of the group of abstract expressionists, and I did want to show, as I've done with several other artists we've looked at, such as Picasso and Van Gogh, some of his early work to show that he was a very highly trained, highly skilled, formal artist. 
He was very influenced by the cubist painters, which you can tell here by the geometric breakdown of these these shapes. And he was also really interested in gesture painting or action painting, similar to Jackson Pollock. His figures as a whole, especially women, are quite grotesque. Often he began painting from a magazine photo and started with a photo of a beautiful woman. And gradually these figures would mutate into grimacing monsters. These very forceful, angry gestures do remind us of action painting. Mark Rothko was very heavily influenced by the surrealists and the idea of working from dreams or folklore. This piece, Swir Slow Swirl at the Edge of the Sea, is a fantastic example of non-representational art. We really can't see any specific figures or pieces to pick out of it. It has a lot of movement to it, and even the title suggests a sense of movement. What Rothko is really known for are his color field paintings, paintings of uh, large areas of color with no obvious structure, focus, or balance. And here is one of those pieces. The example in your book is a different one. Your book has blue, orange, and red from 1961. This is a slightly earlier piece, orange and yellow, from 1956. I'll often have students say to me, how is that art? How is that worth hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars? And the answer that I like to give, or the answer that makes the most sense to me, and you can have a totally different opinion and that's fine, is that he was the first one to do something like this. And as a result, it's what makes this work great. It's not necessarily something that would hold up now. If you tried to do a piece like this and get it into a gallery exhibit, the they would say, oh, that's already been done. That's copying Mark Rothko. But when he did this in 1956, remember the art that we're, we're grounded in during that period of time. Um, the most progressive art was Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, and that was building upon the art of the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. So very, very traditional artwork had been done um, up until just 50 years prior to this. We're supposed to see this as a misty and magical world even though there's nothing particular to pick out of the image. There's no form for us to grasp onto. Helen Frankenthaler was influenced by Pollock's work and was working in much the same um, method using a type of gesture painting, but instead of splattering or dripping paint, she was pouring paint onto the canvas, totally eliminating the texture of paint as the liquid spread across the canvas. Assemblage artists were creating sculptures by assembling found or sometimes discarded objects. and the overall image that would come out of it may or may not have anything to do with the original identity of the objects or um, an intended purpose for the object. Think back to uh, John Keyholt's John Doe that we looked at at the beginning of the semester, that mannequin stuffed inside of the child stroller. Um, the parts all put together, maybe they had a greater meaning as a whole, but not necessarily. One of the leaders in this movement of assemblage work is Louise Nevelson. This is called Sky Cathedral. And if you look closely, there's all different objects, um, parts of a broom, parts of baseball bats, bowling pins, um, discs from sanding wheels. And she took all these items, painted them all black, and put them together. She only worked with wood or softer objects. She, a, a lot of her contemporaries, a lot of her peers were working with metal, and she felt that metal reminded her of war and the harshness of war. She had lost children in in the war. Her son died in the war, but everyone's son had died in the war. She, as a, as a female artist and as a mother, she was more interested in working in softer materials, even though they look hard. Rauschenberg's assemblage here is really just about juxtaposition of these unrelated objects, uh, maybe asking us to try to find a meaning even though there's really not one to decode. Often they'll give these things titles, so here we have the title monogram, and maybe that has to do with the letters that we can almost see, maybe it has to do with the animal cover, its face covered in paint. Um, we're, we're 
encouraged to think deeply about these things, but in reality they may not, or most likely do not, have a deep meaning. Another of Rauschenberg's assemblages, winter pool. Again, what is the winter pool? Is that the empty space in, the, in between the latter? Is it the um, on the right-hand side, the white and blue lighter areas that maybe look like frozen over water? Um, we can't know if he's actually intending something or if he's almost poking fun at us for trying, for, you know, he put this, this assemblage together um, and here we are trying to decode or understand what he was meaning by it. And maybe he didn't mean anything by it. Maybe it was just about, just as the surrealists were playing with um, drawing and doodling in a trance-like state and then coaxing out meaning from those images once they finished, maybe there's a similar method here. He assembled all these things together and in the end tried to coax out a meaning. Here again, to refresh your memory, Keen Hall John Doe that we looked at earlier in the semester. This artist, Jasper Johns, is one of the most famous of the assemblage artists working in this group of abstract expressionism. He often will use very recognizable items and images, targets, faces, sometimes American flags, U.S. maps, numerals, letters. By choosing these things, he felt that the work had already been done for him, and he was able to concentrate on composition or design of the images. Art should be an affirmation of life, not an attempt to bring order out of the chaos, nor to suggest improvements in creation, but simply a way of waking up to the very life we are living. John Cage, a composer working in this group. There's a very exciting group of artists working at this time, putting on things called events or happenings. Uh, now we think of them as performance art. And you're to watch a video this week, Marina Ambramovic's The Artist is Present, which really uh, shows a great portrayal of what these happenings or events would have looked like and what performance art over the course of an artist's career looks like. I'd also like for you to watch now, this is a short video, Ching Jean Tingley's uh, Homage to New York, uh, self-constructing, self-destructing work of art. It's a video from 1960. And you'll see this wild contraption that Jean had, had put together. And the performance art piece of it was that he would turn it on in front of a group of people that have come to see it. And the piece itself whirs and moves around and starts to disintegrate as it's moving. In the courtyard of a seedy hotel, Alan Capro erected a five-story mountain of scaffolding and covered it with black paper. Top, they set an altar uh, with a large mattress, and above it, they suspended a large dome covered in paper. A woman in white danced around the base of the scaffolding and climbed up to the mattress. Eventually, the dome lowered over the top Photographers that you see on the ladder here followed her up and took her picture. This was an invented modern ritual, and they called these things happenings. They would invite a great number of people, as you see in the courtyard, and after the event was completed, the only evidence of this art piece were the photographs that were taken. There are many modern artists doing these happenings or performance art pieces. Of course, we mentioned Marina Abramovic again, um, but somebody who you probably would know a little better from popular culture is Jay-Z. And I'd like for you to watch the Picasso Baby link below. Marina Abramovic was invited to be a part of this piece because Jay-Z and most of the performance art world sees her as the queen of performance art. The other people that were invited to this were all artists, um, some of them ballerinas, some of them musicians, that were invited for a very small moment to interact with Jay-Z on stage. And the outcome was something that was totally unscripted and unpredictable. You saw this scene reenacted in The Artist is Present. On the right is Marina Abramovic, on the left her partner Ule. And they stood in a doorway of a very busy uh, gallery entrance and people had to choose whether they would face the naked male or the naked female. Anna Mandina used her own body in these pieces of art, these 
symbolic performance pieces that she did, she would cover herself in mud and create a disguise trying to blend in with her surroundings. And then someone would take a photograph of it. And the photograph is the documentation of this piece that she did. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, a style emerged called pop art. And this was a style of painting and sculpture that used the gold mine of visual material available, uh, the mundane mass-produced objects and the Im images of America's pop culture, such as comic books, advertising, billboards, and packaging. And they would use these images in a mass production fashion. So they would use things like silk screening and casting molds of real objects. Uh, in these works in order to get a, a very polished and often ironic um, outcome. Richard Hamilton, one of the leaders of this movement, published a list of characteristics of pop art. So popular, designed for a mass audience, transient, meaning a short-term solution. So um, think about our Walmart disposable world we live in, things that are only meant to be used for a short period of time. Expendable, easily forgotten, low cost, mass-produced, young, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, big business. In contrast to assemblages, which are assembled with three-dimensional objects, montages are assembled with two-dimensional objects. And this is one of Richard Hamilton's uh, montages or photo montages. It's meant to be ironic or um, a, a, a funny parody of what he says in the um, his title here. Just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? And the the pop that you see there, the um, Tootsie Roll pop that's covering his private parts that he's gesturing to with his hand, that is, generally speaking, where the name pop art came from. Andy Warhol was another leader in this movement. This is his Marilyn Monroe, which he produced over and over and over again. It shows the the artist Marilyn Monroe in a very garish and, and very sloppy vision of herself. The makeup overdone, her hair, um, the, gold, the yellow goldness of her hair accentuated. Um, so this was an image that was used for publicity right after Marilyn Monroe's death. And he took this image and repeated it over and over and over again using a silkscreen process. Basing most of his work on hand-drawn advertising or commercial art, Lichtenstein would take these popular images and he would paint them. He reduced the several color printing format, the 16 color printing format that was used at the time, to simply four colors when he worked. He cropped originals such as this, this was from a comic book, rotated it 45 degrees, reduced it using just the primary colors, and enlarged it to five feet in height. Frank Stella famously said about minimalist art, what you see is what you see. Minimal artists, minimalist artists, use completely non-representational imagery and often severely restricted their, their color palette uh, and their shapes down to very geometric and very simplified shapes. Frank Stella himself would use these curved canvases. The outline of this shape that you see would be the shape of the canvas because he didn't want uh, to use a rectangular canvas. He didn't want you confusing what he was doing with a picture. He felt like what he was doing was outside of a picture. The subject of the painting is color and shape and form itself. There's no figure and ground relationship, such as in a painting where you have figures in the foreground and a background image or shapes or objects in the foreground, in the case of a still life, and then a background, a table that it's sitting on and a wall behind it. Often minimalist artists would use very standard manufacturing techniques in order to create their art. So this is the exact same shape repeated over and over again with a gradient of color. And again, the subject of this, this installation is color, is shifting of color. There's not supposed to be a deep interpretation for it. What you see is what you see. In the case of conceptual art, an idea takes place of an object.
In Joseph Coote's One in Three Chairs, this installation had the actual chair, a photograph of the chair, and the definition of a chair, begging you to understand or ponder which is the true chair, which is the essence of the chair. And thinking back to Rene Magritte's uh, Betrayal of Images, the treachery of images at the beginning of the semester. That was the photograph or the painting of the pipe and the caption underneath it said, this is not a pipe. This is begging you to really think about what we say when we're looking at something. Is this a photograph of a chair or is it an actual chair? Is it a painting of a chair or an actual chair? Site-specific works and earthworks are both outdoor installations. There's a little difference between them. Site-specific works are works that were made for a specific place. They can't be moved or separated from their environment, such as the gates in Manhattan, which we'll look at an image of shortly. Earthworks are sculptural forms made from earth, rocks, and plants. Sometimes they're deliberately impermanent, and we can think about Andy Goldsworthy for a fantastic example of that. This is a site-specific work. This is called Running Fence, and it's by two partner artists, Cristo and John Claude, a husband and wife team that worked together for several decades. This was 18 feet high and went on for 24 and a half miles to the heart of Sonoma County. It cost millions of dollars to put up, and eventually, when it was taken down, the pieces of it were sold to help pay for the exhibit itself. This piece, running fence, cannot be separate from its environment, which is what makes it unique. John claude and Christo's probably most famous piece. This is called The Gates, and it was a series of, of a saffron-colored gates that went for miles, winding through all the paths of Central Park in Manhattan. It was only supposed to be installed for a few days, but because of the incredibly positive response they had for these beautiful saffron gates in this bleak winter that they were installed during, uh, it was left up for quite a bit longer. Robert Smithson is one of the founders of the Earthworks movement. He created this piece to spiral jetty in Salt Lake City, Utah, and it's come in and out of vision several times as the landscapes changed over the years. I love what your book says about this being a willful human design. This is not something that nature could have created on its own. Early in the semester, we looked at some of Andy Goldsworthy's work. I highly recommend the full-length documentary Rivers and Tides available on Netflix about his uh, a longer-term vision of his work and some projects he was working on at the time of the documentary. This Touching North piece, it's an earthwork piece and it's transient. It's not meant to be uh, a long-term installation. So this is made out of ice. We know that ice will melt at some point. When we talked about Mark Rothko a few moments ago, the color field paintings that he did, I mentioned that they were important or interesting to us because it was the first time that someone had ever done that. And modern art was really about rejecting tradition and breaking those rules that had been in place for thousands of years about what art should be. Artists today are left with very few rules to break. Um, one of the things that artists try to do when they make new art to stand out is to be offensive, but it's really difficult to make a completely new style, such as cubism or minimalism. Generally speaking, artists today are not striving for that, for creating something totally new. Susan Rothenberg belongs to a group of artists called neo-expressionists. They are trying to revive the idea of expressionism, in which subject matter is almost minimalized against the idea of expressing oneself. Street art, or more commonly referred to as graffiti, is art that's been developed in public spaces, which includes traditional graffiti art, as well as stencil, sticker, and wheat pasting art. I'd like for you to watch the time lapse of graffiti going up that's in the links below. At the beginning of the semester, we watched the video 70 Million by Hold Your Horses. I'd like for you to watch that again now, and I would like for you to do the same thing, the tallies. How many images do you now recognize? And I hope that you'll recognize all, or at least nearly all of them. I'd like for you to select five of these images, and I want you to tell me the stories behind them and about the artists as you've learned this semester. So this is not using internet research. This is using text and lecture 
um, to support your answer. In closing, for our last lecture of the semester, I just wanted to share with you this wonderful quote from Jim Jarmusch, which is about modern art and creating art. Nothing is original. Steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, painting, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, body of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you feel like it. In any case, always remember what John luc Godard said. It's not where you take things from, it's where you take things to. So thank you so much for a wonderful semester. We do have one more week of class, but this will be your last lecture for the semester.